Association as we continue, Shrimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, Chapter 2, verses 22 32, Lord in the Heart. 
ಓಂ ಜ್ಞಾನತಿ ಮೇ ವಂದಸ್ಯ ಜ್ಞಾಂಜನ ಶಲಾಕಾಯ ಚಕ್ಷೋರನ್ ಮಿಲಿತ ಯೇನ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುವೇ ನಮಃ ಶ್ರೀ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಮನೋಭೀಷ್ಟ ಸ್ಥಾಪಿತ ಯೇನ ಭೂತಲೆ ಸ್ವಯಂ ರೂಪ ಕದಾಮಯ ದಾತಿ ಸ್ವಾಂಟಿಕ ವಂದೇಹಂ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರು ಶ್ರೀಯುತ ಪದ ಕಮಲ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುನ್ ವೈಷ್ಣವಂ ಶ್ರೀರೂಪ ಸಾಗ್ರಜಾತ ಸಗನ ರಘುನಾಥ ಸಜೀವ ಸದ್ವೈತ ಸಾವದೂತ ಪರಿಜನ ಸಹಿತ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯದೇವ ಶ್ರೀ ವಾದಾಕೃಷ್ಣ ಪದ ಸಗನ ಲಲಿತಾ ಶ್ರೀ ವಿಶಾಖಾ ಹೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಕರುಣಾ ಸಿಂಧೋ ದೀನ ಬಂಧೋ ಜಗತ್ಪತೆ ಗೋಪೇಶ ಗೋಪಿಕಾ ಕಂಥ ರಾಧಕಂಥ ನಮಸ್ತುತೆ ಸಪ್ತ ಕಾಂಚನ ಗೌರಂಗೀ ವಾದೇ ವೃಂದಾವನೇಶ್ವರಿ ವೃಷಭಾನುಸುತೆ ದೇವಿ ಪ್ರಣಮಿ ಹರಿ ಪ್ರಿಯ ಪಂಚಕಲ್ಪತರೂಪ್ಯ ಕೃಪಾ ಸಿಂಧು ದೇವ ಪತಿತ ಭಾವನೆಭ್ಯೋ ವೈಷ್ಣವೇಭ್ಯೋ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ನಮೋ ವಿಷ್ಣುಪದಾಯ ಕೃಷ್ಣಪೃಷ್ಠಾಯ ಭೂತಲೆ ಶ್ರೀಮತೆ ಭಕ್ತಿ ವೇದಾಂತ ಸ್ವಾಮೀಜಿ ನಮನೆ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ದೇವೇ ಗೌರವಾನಿ ಪ್ರಚಾರಿಣೆ ನಿರ್ವಿಶೇಷ ಶೂನ್ಯವಾದಿ ಪಸ್ತಿ ಜೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭು ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗದಾಧಾರ ಶ್ರೀವಾಸರಿ ಗೌರಭಕ್ತ ಬೃಂದ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೇ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೇ ಹರೇ ಸರ್ವಶಾಸ್ತ್ರ ಪೀಯೂಷ ಸರ್ವ ವೈರೇಕ ಸತ್ಫಲ ಸರ್ವ ಸಿದ್ಧಾಂತರಾತ್ನಾದಿಯ ಸರ್ವ ಲೋಕಾಯ ತ್ರಿಪ್ರದ ಸರ್ವ ಭಾಗವತ ಪ್ರಾಣ ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ ಭಾಗವತ ಪ್ರಭು ಕಲಿದ್ವಂದೋ ದಿದಾತಿತ್ಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಪರಿವರ್ತಿತ ಓ ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ ಭಾಗವತ ಓ ನೆಕ್ಟ್ ಚರ್ನ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದೋಷನ್ ಓ ವಿ ಸ್ಕ್ರಿಪ್ಚರ್ಸ್ ಓ ಮೋಸ್ ಪ್ರಮನ್ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ಲ್ ಟು ದ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ವೇರಿಯಸ್ ಓ ಯು ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ರಿಚ್ ವರ್ಡ್ ಜೂಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುಯಲ್ ಫಿಲಾಸಫಿಕಲ್ ಕನ್ಕ್ಲೂಷನ್ ಓ ಯು ಗ್ರಾನ್ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುಯಲ್ ವಿಜನ್ ಟು ಆಲ್ ದ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಓ ಲೈಫ್ ಬ್ರೆತ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ವೈಷ್ಣವ ಡಿಬೋಟೀಸ್ ಓ ಲಾರ್ಡ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಅ ಸನ್ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ರಿಸನ್ ಟು ಡಿಸ್ಪಿಯಲ್ ದ ಕಲಿ ಯುಗ ಯು ಆರ್ ಆಕ್ಚುಲ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹೂ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ರಿಟರ್ನ್ ಅಮಂಗ್ಸ್ ಆಸ್ ಪರಮಾನಂದ ಪಾತಾಯ ಪ್ರೇಮ ವರ್ಷಾಶಾಯತೆ ಸರ್ವದ ಸರ್ವ ಸೇವ್ಯಾಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣಾಯ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಓ ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ ಭಾಗವತಂ ಐ ಓಫರ್ ರಿಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟ್ಫುಲ್ ಬೇಸ್ ಆನ್ ಟು ಐ ರೀಡಿಂಗ್ ಯು ಆನ್ ಅಟೈನ್ ಸ್ಟಾನ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಆಂಡ್ ಬ್ಲಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಯೋರ್ ಸೋಲ್ ಬೋಸ್ ರೈನ್ ಪಿಯೋರ್ ಲವ್ ಫರ್ ಅಪ್ ಆನ್ ದ ವೀರ ಯು ಆಲ್ವೇಸ್ ಬಿ ಸಬ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಒನ್ ಫಾರ್ ಯು ಆನ್ ಕಾನೇಶನ್ ಆಫ್ ಲವ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಮದಕ ಬಂಧು ಮದ್ ಸಂಗಿ ಮದ್ ಗುರು ಮದ್ ಮಹಾಧನ ಮನ್ ನಿಷ್ಠರ್ಕ ಮದ್ ಭಾಗ್ಯ ಮದ್ ಆನಂದ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಓ ಶಿಮರ್ ಭಾಗತಂ ಓ ಮೈ ಓನ್ ಫ್ರೆಂಡ್ ಓ ಮೈ ಕಂಪೆನ್ ಓ ಮೈ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಟೀಚ್ ಓ ಮೈ ಟೀಚ್ ಓ ಮೈ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ವೆಲ್ತ್ ಓ ಮೈ ಡಿಲವರ್ ಓ ಮೈ ಗುಡ್ ಫಾರ್ಚುನ್ ಓ ಮೈ ಬ್ಲಸ್ ಐ ಆಫ್ ರಿಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟ್ಫುಲ್ ಬೇಸನ್ಸ್ ಆನ್ ಟು ಸಾಧು ಸಾಧು ತಾಹೀನ್ ತೀನಿ ಚೋಚ ತಾರಕ ಅನಮುನ್ ಚಾಕ ದಾ ಚಿನ್ಮ ಪ್ರೇಮ್ ನ ರಿತ್ಕತೆಯೋ ಸ್ಪುರ ಓ ಶಿಮರ್ ಭಾಗವತಂ ಓ ಗಿವ್ ಓ ಸೀಂಕ್ಲಿ ನಿಸ್ ತರಾನ್ ಸೀಂಕ್ಲಿ ಓ ಆಫ್ ಲವ್ ಟು ವೆರಿ ಫುಲ್ ಪ್ಲೀಸ್ ಡೋ ಪ್ಲೂಸ್ ಪ್ಲೀಸ್ ಡೋ ನಾಟ್ ಐ ಲೀವ್ ಮೀ ಪ್ಲೀಸ್ ಬಿ ಕಮ್ ಮ್ಯಾನಿಫೆಸ್ ಮಹಾತ್ಮ ಥ್ರೋಟ್ ಕಂಪ್ನಿ ಆಫ್ ಯುವರ್ ಲವ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೇ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೇ ಹರೇ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಜನ್ಮಾದಿ ಯಥೋನ್ವಯಾರಿತರತ ಚಾರ್ಟೆ ಸ್ವಿಘ್ನಸ್ವರ ತೇನೆ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ಹೃದಯಾದಿ ಕವಯೇ ಭೂಯಂತಿ ಯತ್ಸೂರಯ ತೇಜೋ ವರಿ ಮೃದಂ ಯಥಾ ವಿನಿಮಯೋ ಯತ್ರಾತಿ ಸರ್ಗೋ ಮೃಷಾ ತಂ ನ ಸ್ವೇನ ಸದಾ ನಿರಸ್ತ ಕುಹಕಂ ಸತ್ಯಂ ಪರಂ ಧೀಮಯೀ ಓ ಮೈ ಲಾಚಿ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಸನ್ ಓ ವಸುದೇವ Oh, for very first note of God, I offer my respectful obeisance. I made it upon Lord Shri Krishna because he is the absolute truth and the primal cause of all causes of creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universe. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations and he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahma, the original being being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion as one is bewildered by this representation of water seen in fire or land seen on water. Only because of him did the material universe is
such devotional service must be unmotivated and uninterrupted to continue to satisfy this thought. Vasudeva Baba Gavati Bhakti Yoga Prayojita Jana Yatyu Savai Ragyam Kyanam Chahad Yad Adhai Tukam by rendering devotional service unto the personality of God at Sri Krishna, one immediately acquires causeless knowledge and detachment from the world. Vedanti tat tat tovidas tat tvam yach knana madvayam brahmeti paramatmeti bhagavaniti sabyate learn the transcendentalists who know the absolute truth called this non-dual substance brahman paramatma bhagavan. Shru 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 shraddha shru 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 shraddha dana sya vasudeva kata ruchi syan mata syan mahat sepaya vipra punya tirta nishevana O to wise born sages, by serving those devotees are completely free from all vice great services done by such service, one gains a penalty for hearing the messages of Vasudeva. Shrinvatam Swakata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana Riddanta Stoya Badrani Vidu Noti Suritsatam Shri Krishna, the person of the Godhead, who is Paramatma, super soul in everyone's heart, and the benefactor of the truthful devotee cleanses desire for material enjoyment from the heart of the devotees, develops the urge to hear his messages. Which are in themselves virtues when properly heard and chanted. Nastrapaisha Badreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Sloke Bhaktir Bhavati Neshtiki. By regular attendance in a class in the Bhagavatam and by rendering of service to the pure devotees, all that is troublesome to the heart is almost completely destroyed in loving service unto the person of the Godhead who is praised with transcendental song is established by an irrevocable fact. Etavan Sankhya Yoga Bhyam Swadharmam Pari. Nishtaya Janmalaba Parapum Sam Antenara Yanasmriti, the highest perfection of human life achieved either by complete knowledge of matter and spirit, by practice of mystic powers, or by perfect discharge of occupational duties that remember the personality of God at the end of it. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. We are counting Shrimad Bhagavatam based on the teachings of the Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shilpahapa, the Pambacharya of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Hare Krishna, and welcome again. Let us cover if anyone has any feedback from last week's session, chapter 2, verses 15 to 21. If you have any feedback, any points that you remember that you would really like to recollect, please type that in the chat. And while you are typing in the chat, I will share uh, two statements from Srila Prabhupada's purpose from last week. The mind is easily conquered simply by engaging it at the lotus feet of the Lord. Gradually by such service, all the senses become automatically engaged in the service of the Lord. That is the way of merging into the supreme absolutes. So here Prabhupada hmm, is sharing uh, the true statement of merging with absolute. The impersonalists they want to merge with God. And the Vaishnavas, uh, they do not accept. It is one of the five types of liberations to merge with the Supreme. But of the five, we do not accept merging with the Supreme, coming one with the Supreme. Why? Because there's no service. When you merge with God, when you become one with God, then there is no identity of master and servant, or servant, a devotee, a bhakta and bhagavan. And because there's no identity of bhakta and bhagavan, then there's no devotion, there's no exchange of service. And uh, service for the devotee is a pure devotional service for a devotee. Of the Lord is his life and soul. So therefore, uh, we don't accept Sayuja Mukti merging with the Supreme. But we uh, still want to merge with the Supreme in terms of desire. So here Prabhupada is describing uh, that when the mind is engaged in the service of the Lord, and senses are engaged in the service of the Lord, then the mind becomes conquered. And uh, when all our senses are automatically engaged, when we are fully engaged, mind, body, and words, everything is engaged in the service of Krishna, then we've become one with Krishna on the transcendental platform. Not in terms of losing our identity, but in perfectly aligning our identity with the supreme identity of Krishna. And... Uh, in that service attitude, we surrender to 
the desire of Krishna, the will of Krishna. So therefore, one's desire becomes one with the desire of the supreme absolute truth. And therefore, uh, that type of merging we accept. Every other form of merging uh, is spiritual suicide for a devotee. Then the process of giving up all material connections and returning home back to Godhead, the Supreme, is recommended herein. The condition is that one should be completely freed from the desire for material enjoyment. So we've covered many statements in the Bhagavatam and uh, in Canto 1, and also we'll be covering even further. So these statements are in relation to the qualification required to go back home. Going back home is not just a matter of affiliation. For well, I'm a Hare Krishna, uh, I'm connected to Srila Prabhupada, therefore I'm going back home. No, it's not that easy or not that simple, let's put it that way. Not that cheap. Yes, it's our good fortune of being connected, but uh, there is a qualification that's required. Now, it's true that our connection with Srila Prabhupada, with the disciplic succession, is so powerful and potent that even if one is not serious, if one stays connected, one will eventually become perfect. But that will take a long, long time. It's like uh, being dropped into a river in the direction of the current. So the river with its strong current will take you to its destination, in this case, the ocean. Even if you do nothing, you just lie on your back and you just allow the waves or the uh, current of the river to pull you and drag you wherever it needs to go, needs to take you. And you'll be battered here and then taken eventually, you end up to the destination. So the flow of the current is strong enough to pull you to its destination. But... That is based on the current of the river. Now you could expedite that by swimming in the direction of the current. So if you put and place effort and swim in the direction of the current, then you will be able to reach the destination faster. In fact, now you are pacing the destination and not depending on nature. So similarly, uh, we also don't want to just be in Krishna consciousness and that's it. I'm Hare Krishna. But we really want to take the process seriously so that we can expedite the result. Otherwise, it can take a long, long, long time. And one of the things that we need to work on is our material desires, especially the desire to enjoy and lord it over material energy. So that desire we need to work on, we need to purify, we need to transform that desire to the desire to serve and not to lord over, not to be master, but to be servant. And the more we purify our life, the more we purify our desires, material desires, the quicker we will become qualified for further eligibility to enter into the spiritual world. Becoming free from material desire does not mean we can go back in the internal service of Krishna. Becoming free from material desire means we are liberated. We still need to cultivate as Prabhupada would say, the service attitude. So one is becoming free from material desire, the baggage, unnecessary baggage that we're carrying. 
that keeps us in this world. And the second is to cultivate the service attitude. Once we cultivate the service attitude and we're free from material desires, then uh -uh, Krishna's mercy will drag us back to his eternal shelter. My chairman and the Prabhu says, Hare Krishna Prabhu, last week we heard about layers upon the soul. Can you kindly share some of these that are covering the soul and our true identity? Which specific verse are you referring to? I just want to understand the context. Uh, do you have the reference of the verse specifically that talks about the layers? So I can just have a look and then we can just recap those. Because they are different, uh, maybe in the purport. Let's just check. So last week, they were different from my memory. We were talking about, so first, just a correction. Uh, when I was talking about the lifespan of Brahma, I made a mistake. Uh, in fact, in today's purports, we'll uh, come to that time span. Uh, Lord Brahma's lifespan, according to our lifespan, is 311 trillion, 40 billion years. A long, 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 very, very long time. So that was the one thing. Then in terms of layers, so uh, maybe uh, I'll just share from, I recall it from my memory in terms of layers. And then next week you can recap. You can just see reference the appropriate purport and we can look at that again. Uh, so there are different coverings of the soul. One is uh, in relation to last week's session, which was talking about uh, the advanced yogi, how he advances. So the soul is covered by uh, different life airs. So that's the one aspect of covering life airs. Uh, then uh, there's uh, the covering of the soul in terms of gross and subtle coverings or layers. And so the soul is covered by the first subtle layer, which is false ego. Then it's covered by intelligence. Then it's covered by the mind. And then it's covered by uh, the body and the senses. So those are the different layers uh, that the soul is entrapped in. Uh, then we have the life airs. There are 10 different life airs that also is part of the mechanism of the this material world, which also covers uh, the soul. Uh, then there can also be layers of covering in relation to anartas, which are the effects of these coverings. For example, uh, according to our activities, according to our association, we are influenced. We are covered. And these influences entraps us more and more into uh, the karmic cycle. So the soul is really helpless. And uh, we need to purify ourselves to overcome these challenges. Yes. Okay, you have your hand up. You can share. I've allowed you to unmute. Okay, so uh, the covering, so these are the coverings and layers. The yogi, he's able to penetrate. Now there's, in, in terms of last week's verse, also in relation to coverings, we also have the universal coverings, which is, uh, 10 in number in terms of uh, the material elements, 7 or 10 in number. Each layer is 10 times bigger than the previous layer. And these layers are earth, water, fire, air, ether, uh, false ego. These are all the different layers that is covering the universe 
and the mechanical process of penetrating or going back to the spiritual simply means firstly i need to overcome and control my life as i need to overcome all my gross senses mind intelligence and false ego i need to be controlling and purifying all those elements and then i need to after i've control all these aspects i need to then traverse through all these different layers of material covering that within themselves have obstacles in the third canto we may cover uh, this aspect also in the possible in the fifth canto the universe Uh, let's say there's earth water fire air ether so there's these different uh, walls of the prison and within the wall of each prison uh, its thickness is very very huge right if you just consider uh, the earth's dimension the universe dimension is 4 billion miles in our case and the first covering is 10 times that second covering is 10 times that third covering 10 times like that if you just take you know even if it's a 1 meter and multiply that by 10 and then multiply that by 10 multiply that by 10 it's astronomical it's huge and that is why it's impossible for a living entity to penetrate all these layers and coverings in fact it's as described that even within these layers there are obstacles so that when the soul goes past there according to that layer there are different obst- uh, obstacles that tempts him and distracts him and in this way he unfortunately gets covered 218 in that sky which is far far beyond the material sky and it's sevenfold covering right so it's sevenfold there is no need of sun moon no is a necessity of electricity illumination because planets are self luminous and more brilliant then uh, the sun yes so the seven so here the coverings are in terms of uh, the universe has so remember this is a prison house and this prison house has walls like any prison has walls and you'll see if you go to certain prisons you find that there is a fence electric fence i electric fence then there's space and they have some in some you know prison they have animals wild dogs ostriches in that space then they have another huge wall and then they may have another wall so they have different layers of protection security mechanisms to protect the prisoners from going out similarly lord krishna has also made this material world with walls of the prison so earth water fire air ether mind false ego So I know the five material elements are definitely uh, part of these uh, and there may be an other two we can obviously research and check the exact details but these are the seven fold coverings and each is 10 times bigger so if for example if the first layer earth uh, then the next layer uh, uh, water so the water layer is 10 times that of the earth then fire 10 times the time the dimension of the earth layer uh, sorry the water layer earth water f- earth water fire air uh, air is 10 times that of fire and then ether 10 times then uh, ego and i will have to find possibly the mind or another element so there's different these are the different elements and that's the covering that krishna or in the purport is referred to sevenfold covering of the material universe the spiritual world is completely free from these unnecessary gross subtle material coverings right so that is in relation to that i'm sure we'll come across a purport that will give us uh, that we i guess next week we'll just research and give the exact coverings that are covering the earth all right let us proceed so 
We're going to be covering 22 to 32. Uh, quite a few purports that are there. Various stops before liberation. So now in uh, this section, we're going to be covering uh, the gradual process of liberation. 22. Yadi prayashyan ripapa parameshtyan veha yasanam utayad viharam astadipatyam gunasan nivaye saheva gachen manasendriyescha. However, O king, if a yogi maintains a desire for improved material enjoyments, like transference to the topmost planet, Brahmaloka, or achievement of the Eightfold Mystic, Eightfold Perfections, travel in outer space with the Baha, Veha Yash, Yasya, Yasas, or a situation in one of the millions of planets, then he has to take away with him the materially molded mind and senses. So we covered last week in the section we covered last week. That was for the advanced yogi. So in this section, uh, it's we're covering uh, the process for the gradual process for those yogis who are not that advanced. And therefore, uh, it's a slower process, more gradual, uh, but achievable. The, as long as one is on the path one will need to continue to purify one's desires. So here we see the yogi, he has material desires. He is not interested in enjoying gross matter, but he has subtle material desires. He wants to enjoy mystic powers, want to travel. These are some of the subtle desires that are still there. Purport. In the upper status of planetary systems, there are facilities thousands and thousands of times greater for material enjoyment than in lowly planetary systems. The topmost planetary system consists of the planets like Brahmaloka and Dhruvaloka, the pole star, and all of them are situated beyond Mahaloka. The inhabitants of those planets are empowered with eightfold achievements of mystic perfection. They do not have to learn and practice the mystic process of yoga perfection and achieve the power of becoming small like a particle, anima siddhi, or lighter than soft feather, lagima siddhi. They do not have to get anything or, or they do not have to get anything or everything from anywhere and everywhere, prapti siddhi. To become heavier than the heaviest, mahima siddhi. To act freely even to create something wonderful or to annihilate anything at will, ishitva siddhi. To control all material elements, vaish Sitva Siddhi, to possess such power as will never be frustrated in any desire. Prakamya Siddhi, and to assume any shape or form one may even whimsically desire. Kama Vyava Siddhi. Kama Vyasita Siddhi. So these are the different eightfold mystic Siddhis that the living entity, the yogi, may fall prey to. Now we find Prabhupada is making the point uh, that right, in the many planets, the yogi does not need to strive for these. The demigods, when they are born in the higher plant systems, then automatically they are born with these mystic perfections. It's part of their being born in the heavenly planets. Yogis in this material world that try to strive and perfect the yoga path, uh, they obviously get these as byproducts. And these byproducts are also obstacles. Just like on the path of bhakti, in devotional service, one may also get byproducts. One may get pratishta, fame, adoration, wealth, followers. These are byproducts. And one may get distracted by these byproducts. The karmi, uh, he works hard and he also gets byproducts, sense enjoyment and wealth, women. And therefore he also gets traps, trapped. So in every process, there are byproducts. But if your focus is on the goal, you will not be distracted by the byproducts. 
So if the yogi truly knows that the goal is him, or Krishna, Supreme Personality of Godhead, then he will not be distracted by all these secondary obstacles that may be there, that may come. Uh, but there are those that love these things. And uh, we know, uh, just like people love magicians. Now, it's true that in this world, there are um, fake magicians who, by sleight of hands, by mechanical mechanisms, uh, by, uh, let's say, sight or exploiting the defect of sight and the senses, they're able to present magic as real. But they're basically just exploiting the weaknesses that are there, that the living entity has and that uh, uh, we cannot pick up. But they're actually true magicians who generally would be yogis or demigods in their past life that fell from the heavenly planets into this material world and they still have remnants of the cities and therefore they are born with them. And there are others who, due to their past piety, uh, are quite evolved and therefore they still, they're on the path of mystic perfection and they have these cities, but due to the nature of Kali Yuga, they are born and they get distracted from their path. And then they're obviously aware of these powers and they think, oh, this is nice. I can use this for making money and for entertainment. So then they get distracted. But you can imagine uh, to become smaller and the smallest, lighter than the lightest, get anything from anywhere. These are very powerful potencies that can bewilder a living entity. One time one magician came to Srila Prabhupada, he was proper sitting and uh, the magician you know, waved his hand and from Prabhupada's ear, uh, he created a rasgula, an object. And you know, the devotees were so surprised, or even, but a little embarrassed that the magician was using Prabhupada as his, uh, or part of his tricks. And you know, he was doing this a few times and Prabhupada didn't, Obstruct, probably didn't stop him, probably just was entertained. And you know, he was making, uh, he was creating ob an object and then making it disappear and creating an object and making it disappear. After some time, Prabhupada says, Very nice. Uh, can you make death disappear? And the magician said, No, Prabhupada, only you can. So uh, the magician could understand, yes, these are material aspects of creation or manipulation of material energy. But the real magician, the real magic is to stop birth, death, as is an old age. This is the real magic. The real magic is transforming our material desires to completely spiritual desires. That's the real magic. To go from matter to spirit, to go from the material world to the spiritual world. That's uh, real power. That's real magic. And that's when People would ask Srila Prabhupada, show us magic. Prabhupada said, would point to his, his disciples. He says, this is my magic. They have transformed, they give up all bad habits. So yes, even a devotee has these powers. Prabhupada had these powers. A few times Prabhupada showed these mystic powers. So the pure devotee has these, in fact, he described liberation. Mystic city liberation, they all fall at the feet of the pure devotee to tell them, please, they're begging the pure, please, please accept me. Because they also want the pure devotee's association and blessings. So mystic powers are their servants of the pure devotee. And the pure devotee doesn't, even though he has these powers, he does not exploit these powers against Krishna's desire. He may not even use these desires in the service of Krishna. He will practically engage, just like Prabhupada had these powers, but Prabhupada didn't 
use these powers to spread Krishna consciousness. Because if Prabhupada had used these powers to spread Krishna consciousness, just like, for example, Prabhupada could fly. In fact, Prabhupada himself was saying at one time he was testing, uh, he described one of the powers the yogi has is that he can uh, walk on the sun ray to the sun planet. It's one of the mystic powers. So Prabhupada one time in a conversation was saying that he actually was testing this out, <laughs> walking on the sun ray. So, you know, the pure devotee can do that. Now, uh, the pure devotee is going to fly from one place to another. So if he can fly without using an aeroplane, then why didn't Prabhupada do that? He could have done it. He could have just flown. But the problem is if he just flown, if he just used mystic powers, then in the future, People will say, yeah, we can't, we can't spread Krishna consciousness because we don't have mystic powers. Prabhupada was special. He could use mystic powers and he spread Krishna consciousness. But no, Prabhupada didn't exploit these mystic powers for that. He practically spread Krishna consciousness right, as the Acharya to show us the example that we can also help and spread Krishna consciousness. So Prabhupada, in this way, very practically demonstrated how to expand Krishna consciousness. All these expediences, expediences, expediences are as common as natural gifts for the inhabitants of those higher planets. They do not require any mechanical help to travel to, in outer space. And they can move and travel at will from one planet to another planet with no, within no time. The inhabitants of Earth cannot move even to the nearest planet except by mechanical Vehicle by mechanical vehicle like spacecraft, but the highly talented inhabitants of such higher planets can do everything very easily. Okay? So here Prabhupada is making the point, can travel easily. Since a materialist is generally inquisitive in experience, to experience what is actually in such planetary systems, he wants to see everything personally. An inquisitive person tour all over the world to gain direct local experience, but experience. The less intelligent transcendentalist similarly desires to have some experience of those planets about which he has heard so many wonderful things. The yogi can, however, easily fulfill his desires by going there with the present materialistic mind and sense. So, human nature is to experience. I hear something wonderful, I want to experience condition of the living entity. So even the yogi. But the yogi has powers to experience. At the same time, whether you go right up to Brahma Loka, down to Pata Loka, every experience, good, bad or ugly, doesn't matter. Uh, one is still bound by the reality of birth, death, disease and old age. Uh, to different proportions according to the planets. The prime inclination of the materialistic mind is to lord it over the material world. And all the CDs mentioned above are features of domination over the world. So this is now where the obstacle comes in. This is where the challenge is. The, the CDs are very powerful. It's very subtle. They allow you to dominate the material world. So that is why the pure devotee does not fall to this. Does not fall prey to this. Why? Because it just intensifies that loading, loading it over, I can, I can do things with material nature that normal people cannot do. I can walk on water, I can create things, I can uh, change my body to any form. It's like, wow, I'm, I'm powerful. So as soon as one gets trapped, this is the challenge, this is the obstacle. The devotees of the Lord are not ambitious to dominate a false and temporary phenomenon. On the contrary, a devotee wants to dominate the supreme predominator, the Lord. Now it's interesting how Srila Prabhupada is taking the obstacle of lording it over till nature, that desire to control, that desire to lord over. He's taking that and he's just dovetailing that on the spiritual side. So what's the dovetailing of that on the spiritual side? To dominate God. To lord over the Supreme. Who is 
the Lord of all lords, who is the predominator. So instead of dominating material energy, it binds you, try to dominate the Supreme Lord. Now, how do I dominate the Supreme Lord? Because that sounds like, no man, I don't want to dominate God. I don't want to control God. I'm supposed to be a servant. But the key is, how does Krishna become dominated? How does Krishna become controlled by devotion, by love? So in this way, Prabhupada is directing the living entity to the right aspect of domination. A desire to serve the Lord, the supreme predominator, is spiritual or transcendental. And one has to obtain this purification of mind and the senses to get admission into the spiritual kingdom. With a materialistic mind, one can reach the best planet in the universe. But no one with a materialistic mind can enter into the kingdom of God. Senses are called spiritually purified when they are not involved in sense gratification. Senses are called spiritually purified when they are not, engaged, not involved in sense gratification. Senses are require, senses require engagement. And when the senses are engaged totally in the transcendent loving service of the Lord, they have no chance to become contaminated by material infection. Spiritualizing the body, spiritualizing the senses, spiritualizing the mind, spiritualizing the intelligence means that none of these elements are engaged in sense gratification. This is what it means to be spiritually purified or to have spiritual purified sense. Robert gives the example of uh, putting the rod into fire and the rod acquires the uh, fiery nature of fire. So similarly, the senses which have the tendency to exploit the objects of senses, when that is now completely purified, where the senses do not are not involved in sense gratification, but actually involved in pleasing the senses of Rishikesh, the master of the senses, then that means one is now spiritually purified. So we can use this practically to measure, am I becoming spiritually purified? Your nature is you are a spiritual being. If you are a spiritual being, means that you are completely spiritually engaged in the service of the Lord. Now you have these coverings that what your desires, because these coverings haven't come upon you just by luck and by chance or by uh, misfortune. You know, somebody just cast them on me and I didn't ask for it. No, it's uh, according to your desire. So uh, due to your desire, you have these coverings now by changing your desire first and foremost and then by allowing these elements to become purified we now direct our enjoyment through the process of devotional service by giving pleasure to Krishna we derive pleasure so now we avoid enjoying satisfying our senses in this material realm. Satisfaction of senses are still there. It's just that now, Param Drishtva Nivartate, now you've got a higher taste. Instead of the lower taste of sense gratification, gross and subtle in this material world, you have spiritual gratification, enjoyment on the spiritual platform where uh, Krishna is given pleasure first and foremost. And then automatically you get the pleasure. 23. Yogeshwaranam gatimaha ahurantar bahishtri lokya pavanantar atmanam nakarma bistam gatim apnuvanti vidyatapo yoga samadhi bhajam. The transcendentalists are con. con the transcendentalists are concerned with the spiritual body. As such, by the strength of the devotional service, austerity, mystic power, and transcendent knowledge, 
their movements are unrestricted within and beyond the material worlds. Fruit of workers or gross materialists can never move in such an unrestric unrestricted matter. So you get the karmis, or you could say you get the atheists, you get the karmis, you get the yogis, you get the bhaktas. Each one is more free to move to different levels of creation. The devotees are able to move further and to higher dimensions than the yogi. The yogi is able to move to higher dimensions than the karmi. And the karmi is able to move to higher dimensions uh, than those who are atheistic and demonic. The materialistic scientists endeavor to reach other planets by mechanical vehicles is only a futile attempt. One can, however, reach heavenly planets by virtues, by virtues activities. But one can never expect to go beyond Swarga or Janaloka by such mechanical or materialistic activities, either gross or subtle. The transcendentalists who have nothing to do with the gross material body can move anywhere within and beyond the material worlds. Within the material worlds, they can move in the planetary systems of Maha, Jana, Tapas, and Satya Loka. And beyond the material worlds, they can move in the Vaikuntas as unrestricted spacemen. Nar Muni is one of the examples of such spacemen. And Dhruvarsamuni Dhruva is one such mystic is one of such mystics. By the strength of devotional service, austerity, mystic powers, and transcendental knowledge, everyone can move like Narad Muni or Durvasa Muni. It is said that Durvasa Muni traveled throughout the entirety of material space and part of spiritual space within one year only. And the speed of transcendentalists can never be attained by gross or subtle materialists. So, uh, Prabhupada is making very clear, if you are bound by the gross and subtle desires, then you are restricted in your movements. The more you, you are liberated from these, the more you are elevated above these, the further you can traverse the material world. And the pure devotees of the Lord, like Narad Muni, uh, mystics like Dravasa Muni, because they have completely, uh, uh, their, their, their consciousness is on the transcendental plane, allows them to traverse right up to the transcendental plane. Now Muni can travel to any part of Krishna's creation at will. He is said to be the transcendental spaceman. So he can go anywhere. He doesn't need a visa. He doesn't need an invitation. He can go wherever he wants to spread Krishna consciousness. Narad Muni can go. So that is a real power. That's for a scientist. If a scientist had to figure this, you know, or think about this, they'll think, wow, that's like far out. And he doesn't need a space, you know, suit. He doesn't need a, 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 a spacecraft just with his self-same body. And at the speed of the mind, he can travel. This is the power. And Prabhupada is making the point that it is not that these powers are only there for one person. By the strength of devotional service, austerity, mystic powers, and transcendental knowledge, everyone can move like Narad Muni or Durvasa Muni. So that's the law. And everyone. It's not restricted. But you need qualification. What's your adhikar? According to your qualification, if you raise your consciousness, if you transcend the shackles, then you get greater access to facilities for greater service. Most people want facility without responsibility and without service. So, the more one qualifies according to one's consciousness and attitude of service, then the greater facility one has for such service. 
So Narab Muni is a very wonderful example in terms of traversing the space and the areas of Krishna's creation, both material and spiritual. 24. Vaishwa Naram Yati Vihayas Yasagata Shushum Yanaya Shushum Naya Brahma Patena So Sicha So Sichi Sha Vidu Takalko Tahared Udastat Prayati Chakram Nripashai Shumaram O King, when such a mystic passes over the Milky Way, by the illuminating Shumna to reach the highest planet, Brahmaloka, he first he goes first to Vaishvanara, the planet of the deity of fire, wherein he becomes completely cleansed of all contamination, and thereafter he goes, still goes higher to the circle of Shishumara to relate with Lord Hari, the personality of Godhead. The pole star of the universe and the circle thereof are called the Shu, the Shi Shumara circle. And therein, the local resident, residential planet of the personality of God at Shirdh Kasai Vishnu is situated. So if you look at out, if you go outside in the evening, sometimes during the day it's visible, but if you go outside, you'll see there's a brighter star called the pole star, the North Star. That pole star, the North Star, is Dhruvaloka. And Dhruvaloka is like a chandelier, or it's, it's the pivot of the chandelier. And uh, Dhruvaloka is the only, it's a spiritual planet. It's the only planet that is not destroyed. And within that planet is the milk ocean, where Shirada Kasai Vishnu resides. So it's a spiritual planet. That planet's always there eternally. And that's uh, what's been described here. So before reaching there, the mystic powers passes over the Milky Way to reach Brahmaloka. And while going there, he first reaches Vaishva Nara Loka, the place of the demigod controlling fire. On Vaishna, Vaishva Nara Loka, the yogis, becomes completely cleansed of all dirts, dirty sins acquired while in contact with material worlds. The Milky Way in the sky is indicated here in as the way leading to Brahmaloka, the highest planet of the universe. Now, in the fifth canto also, these uh, different structures of the universe is described in great detail, both in terms of location, in terms of dimension, in terms of uh, aspects or characteristics of these planets, who's, uh, who's there, what's there, what they do. And Prabhupada wanted uh, this to be displayed graphically in the Vedic planetarium. So therefore, uh, when one goes to the Vedic planetarium and one enters into the Vedic planetarium and looks up, one will see uh, the whole universal structure, all the places of the demigods, different residents, uh, sun planet, the Milky Way, one will see Shirar Kasai Vishnu's plan, the pole star, the chandeliers type of structure, Brahmaloka. This will all be displayed very graphically, mechanically, so that the people of this world can physically see that oh, this is how the universe is structured according to the Bhagavatam. Scientists have some glimpse according to their senses of outer space, but very restricted and very limited because our senses are defective and therefore according to our technological advancement to that degree we can see. But if the creator of this creation simply gives us this knowledge, and this is how I've created the creation, and this is how it looks, then it becomes very easy to appreciate the creation. 
Yes, we may not see certain things because we may not be qualified, but at the same time, does not mean that uh, it does not exist. Now, for example, here we're talking about the pole star and the pole star is visible by the naked eye. What the, you don't even need a telescope to see the pole star. It's visible by the naked eye. Sa uh, sailors would use the pole star because the pole star is in the north direction. So they would know that that's the pole star, that's north. So this way they would know uh, how to maneuver their ship. Okay? So very, very clear. Now we can see the pole star with our naked eye. We may say, okay, instead of going to the moon, why don't we go to the pole star? Because that's, the, that's according to the Bhagavatam, it's the spiritual planet. Let's go to pole star and set up a place there. So scientists may go there, but if they go to the pole star, they may not necessarily see what's described in the Bhagavatam. Why? Because you cannot necessarily use mechanical means to enter into such territories. You need more subtle means to enter such territories. More spiritual means to enter such territories. Okay? So that's their type of visa to just enter. You can't just gate crash uh, with your spaceship. It's interesting. Chilabhakti uh, Sanamaj also made a statement that in future they, well, uh, the devotees will preach from planet to planet. And in Sri Shopanishad also, Prabhupada says uh, that there will be interplanetary preaching. So, yeah. We'll go to other planets and also spread Krishna consciousness to souls and living entities there. Right? As devotees become more qualified, right? they're able to go. Now, we may be surprised and shocked. Oh, how are you know, interplanetary preaching? Like, hey, how is it possible? Well, now that Muni is doing interplanetary preaching, Srila Prabhupada is doing interplanetary preaching. He's going from one planet to another, one universe to another. So these things are not. Uh, it's not like they the first time. They'll, they'll been happening and it'll eternally be there. To go from one universe to another, one planet to another, uh, help souls be connected to Krishna. 25. Tad Vishvanabhim Tvativartya Vishno Aniyasha Vira Jeta Jenat Maneka Namaskritam Brahma Vidam Upaiti Kalpa Yushoyad Vibudaramen Ramanti. This Shushumara is the pivot for the turning of the complete universe. And it is called the navel of Vishnu, Garbhadaksai Vishnu. The yogi alone goes beyond the circle of Shishumara and attains the planet Maharloka, where purified saints like Brigu enjoy a duration of life of 4,300,000,000 solar years. This planet is worshipable even for the saints who are transcendently situated. So here we getting a little more description of this mm -hmm pivotal point within the universe. The whole universe is basically uh, centered around this pole star uh, pivot turning point. 26. Ato anantasya mukhanale na dandaya manam saniriksha vishwam Niryati Siddhyeshwara Justam Dish Nyam Yadve Yad Yadve Paradyam Taddu Paramestyam. At the time of final devastation, the complete universe of the complete universe, the end of the duration of Brahma's life, a flame of fire emanates from the mouth of Ananta, 
from the bottom of the universe, the yogi sees all the planets of the universe burning to ashes. And thus he leaves for Satyaloka by airplanes used by the great purified souls. The duration of life in Satyaloka is calculated to be 311 trillion 40 billion years. It is indicated here in that the residents of Mahaloka, were, where the purified living entities or demigods possess a duration of life calculated to be 4,320,000,000 solar years, have airships by which they reach Satyaloka, the topmost planet of the universe. In other words, Srimad Bhagavatam gives us many clues about other planets far, far away from us, which modern planes and spacecraft cannot reach even by imaginary speeds. The statements of Srimad Bhagavatam are accepted by great acharyas like Sridha Swami, Ramanujacharya, and Vallabhacharya, Lord Shiji Mahaprabhu, specifically accepts Srimad Bhagavatam as the spotless Vedic authority. And as such, no sane man can ignore the statements of the Srimad Bhagavatam when it is spoken by the self-realized soul, Srila Sukadeva Goswami, who follows in the footsteps of his great father, Srila Vyasa, the compiler of the Vedic literatures. So the bottom line is, this is the absolute truth. We may not be able to comprehend or to even prove it from a materialistic limited perspective. If you want to prove it, you need to raise your consciousness beyond these planes. So that when you transcend these planes, you can see the planes lower down. From a from a aspiring practitioner's perspective, we accept these things as truth. Why? Because great acharyas in our line and uh, coming from other sampradayas have accepted. Sri Daswami, Ramanuja Acharya, Vallabhacharya, Sri Chet Mahaprabhu, all the great acharyas in our line, these were not ordinary souls. These are great personalities with a great level of realization Sri Chit Mahaprabhu is Radha and Krishna himself, an ordinary person. So if Lord Chaitanya is Radha and Krishna is accepting the Bhagavatam as the spotless Purana, as the spotless scripture, then that means that whatever is stated in the Bhagavatam is spotless and true. So for those that have faith, it's very simple to appreciate these descriptions of the creation that's beyond the imagination of conditioned souls. Like you're probably saying that you cannot even fly to these places, even at the speed of imagination. Which is inconceivable speeds. And yet, you can't go to these territories because that's not the way to go to these territories. The yogis... So here it's described that the yogis are able to appreciate and understand that yes, this creation is getting destroyed. The verse talked about Ananta De, Ananta Shesh, uh, who's holding up, described that uh, this universe is like a mustard seed on the hood of Ananta Shesh. Ananta Shesh is carrying the universe on his on his hood, and at the Time of final destruction. Well, there's different types. There's major and minor destructions of the universe. Minor destructions is when half the universe is destroyed at different cycles or continuous cycles. They continue. So, in fact, every night there is every night of Brahma, there is minor destruction of the universe. Half the universe gets destroyed. When Brahma wakes up in the morning, and then he's got service to do, so he recreates. And practically for the whole day, creation continues. 
and then when night comes and Brahma goes to sleep, creation is just half the creation is destroyed, and then Brahma gets up in the morning and then he recreates, and then the creation continues for the duration of Lord Brahma's day. And Lord Brahma's day is a thousand cycles of the four yugas is one day of Brahma. So Sita Yuga, Tetra Yuga, Dwapara Yuga, Kali Yuga, four yugas. If these four yugas cycle a thousand times, that means uh, four billion, 320 million years times a thousand. That's a duration of one day of Brahma. Similarly, that's a duration of one night of Brahma. So a long, 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 long time. So the creation is destroyed, creation is created, destroyed, created, destroyed, and this carries on for every day and night of Brahma. Then when the final dis dissolution, destruction happens, which is at the end of Brahma's life, 311 trillion, 40 billion years. Right now, Lord Brahma has gone through 50 years of his lifespan. Of, so uh, approximately you know, 155 odd or 52 odd. Uh, yeah, 45 odd trillion years still got, still have we still have to go through. Once that's completed, then Anantashesh, uh, he will from his mouth flames of fire uh, practically destroys the whole creation. And at that time, uh, the yogis they're able to see this uh, and then they're able to take uh, space aircrafts to go higher to the highest planet, which is Satya Loka, and from Satya Loka, they're able to then transcend the material creation. In the creation of the Lord, there are many wonderful things we can see with our own eyes every day and night. But we are unable to reach them. We are unable to reach them equipped by modern materialistic science. We should not therefore depend on fragmentary authority of the materialistic science for knowing things beyond the range of scientific purview. For a common man, both modern science and Vedic wisdom are simply to be accepted because none of the statements, either of the modern science or of Vedic literatures can be verified by him. The alternative for a common man is to believe either of them or both of them. The Vedic way of understanding, however, is more authentic because it has been accepted by the Acharyas, who are not only faithful and learned men, but are also liberated soul without any of the flaws of the conditioned souls. The modern scientists, however, are conditioned souls liable to many errors and mistakes. Therefore, the safe side is to accept the authentic version of the Vedic literatures like Srimad Bhagavatam, which is accepted and an Unanimously and anonymously by the great Acharyas. Unanimously by the great Acharyas. Now, probably giving us the reason why we should accept the Vedas. Yes, you can accept the science, scientific field, and you can accept the Vedas. Most people accept scientists because they don't know better. So they accept the science, the science is more intelligent, therefore they accept the scientists. The challenge with accepting science is that they are conditioned souls. Therefore, they are able to make mistakes. It's normal. They are conditioned. I uh, normally give the example of when I was in primary school, uh, I was in science and they taught, you know, the first year I when science had evolved to extend to understand the atom. And uh, they came up with this theory. Yeah, not theory. They obviously, according to the instruments, they're able to uh, understand that the atom is like a billiard ball, indivisible particle, indivisible ball. And this you know, practically was now studied across the whole planet because it was, you know, it was... They were breaking new frontier in terms of understanding the atom. So we were so proud. Wow, science is so powerful. We learned about the atom. It's like a billiard ball. And the next year, they changed 
science textbook in relation to the atom, because now they, you know, by in by research and further technological advancement, they found out that no, 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 now it's not like a billiard ball. It's actually like a raisin bun. Right? A bullet ball is indivisible particles, but a raisin bun's got raisins and then the bun. So there's actually other particles. And then this became like, wow, this is fantastic. Make they became advancement. The following year, that was scrapped. And then uh, we were thought, no, 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 actually, uh, the Rutherford model, that actually now it's not like a raisin bun, but uh, there's the proton, there's the neutrons, you know, and they, uh, the nucleus is there and there's motion. So then Rutherford's model came. And these are indivisible particles, can't go further. And then soon after uh, that was scrapped and another thing, another research was done and they found out actually now you can break up the electrons and protons into further particles. So in this way, according to the evolution of technology, uh, scientists can research more and more and more and more. And in this way, what was studied initially as science, because science is supposed to be studying of facts, but because of a conditioned state, the facts that we study, we cannot perfectly know those facts completely because of our limited conditioned state. So we can only access to the degree of our senses, limited senses and technology. Whereas we find that the Bhagavatam also gives the description of the atom and the structure of the atom and how time is created from the atom, etc. And you know, the whole evolution. If we accept the scientists, we will have to change our understanding year by year or whenever they change. But if we accept the Bhagavatam, then there is absolutely no change. Why? Because the Bhagavatam is presenting the truth completely and perfectly without any faults. So if one had to choose those theories and facts coming from conditioned souls who are very learned, like scientists, or the truth coming from the perfect source, spotless scripts of the Bhagavatam, which is accepted by great liberated souls, learned souls, then naturally Prabhupada is saying we should be inclined to the Bhagavatam. It's not that we do not accept science, but we only accept science when it aligns with scripture, especially the Bhagavatam. We find right now it's very interesting that there are uh, a group of, you, you could call them scientists or researchers, who, I, who, have, who have looked at different scriptures of Vedic theologies that are there from, the, from India, and they've seen that uh, the knowledge that is there contained in the Vedas which modern science and modern mathemati mathematicians have accepted, according from their research, was given in the Vedas thousands and thousands of years, way, way before. The distance of the planets, uh, you know, certain planets like the sun, the size of the sun, moon, planet, if, they, if you cor correlate that to what's given in the Vedas, we find that there is, there is commonality there. So in that way also, there are many things which the scientists have valid, validated according to their research, which is validated in the Vedic scriptures. So therefore, that also gives us greater faith of the validity of the Bhagavatam and, which is, and the knowledge that is there in the Vedas. So for us, one time the devotees are walking on the beach and they told Srila Prabhupada they like to create a university for research. And Prabhupada said the research is already done. It's in the Bhagavatam. You don't need to research. don't need to you know, go into this wasting time. You simply have to accept the research, which is done by the Bhagavatam, by this 
by Sukadeva uh, Goswami, by Srila Vyasadeva, accept and in this way save so much time. So for us, our truth, foundational truth, is the Bhagavatam. Yes, uh, the science, scientists may not be able to see it, verify it, uh, because it's far, far beyond their purview, uh, but it's not that it cannot be verified if you become qualified with the right process of qualification. 27. Nayatra shoka na jara namurtyur nartir nakod vega rit putaschit yachchittato da kripayanindam vidam duranta dukam prabhavanu darshanat in that planet of Satya Loka, there is neither bereavement, nor old age, nor death. There is no pain of any kind. And therefore, there are no anxieties, save that sometimes, due to the consciousness, there is a feeling of compassion for those unaware of the process of devotional service. To the Do not take advantage of successive authorized knowledge. The Vedic knowledge is authorized and is acquired not by experiment, by, but by authentic statement. My internet breaks, just let me know. It's telling me it's unstable. The Vedic knowledge is authorized and is acquainted not by experiment but by authentic statements of the Vedic literatures explained by bona fide authorities. Simply by becoming an academic scholar, one cannot understand the Vedic statements. One has to approach the real authority who has received the Vedic knowledge by disciplic succession as clearly explained in the Bhagavad Gita 4.2. Lord Krishna affirms that the system of knowledge as explained in the Bhagavad Gita was explained to the sun god and the knowledge descended by the simplic succession from the sun god to his son, Manu, and from Manu to King Ishvaku, the forefather of Lord Ramachandra. And thus the system of knowledge was explained down the line of great sages one after another. But in due course of time, the, the authorized succession was broken, and therefore just to reestablish the true spirit of the knowledge, the Lord again explained the same knowledge to Arjuna, who was a bona fide candidate for understanding due to his being a pure devotee of the Lord. How Arjuna understood the Bhagavad Gita is also explained, Bhagavad Gita 10, 12, 12 to 13. But there are many foolish men who do not follow in the footsteps of Arjuna in understanding the spirit of Bhagavad Gita. They create instead their own interpretations, which are as foolish as they themselves, and thereby only help to put a stumbling block on the path of real understanding, misdirecting the innocent followers who are less intelligent or sutras or the sutras. It is said that one must become a Brahmana before one can understand the Vedic statements. And this stricture is as important as the stricture that no one shall become a lawyer who has not qualified himself as a graduate. Such a stricture is not an impediment in the path of progress for anyone and everyone, but it is necessary to prevent the unqualified from spreading their misunderstandings for a particular science. Vedic knowledge is misinterpreted by those who are not qualified Brahmanas. A qualified Brahmana is one who has undergone the strict training under the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master. So Prabhupada is describing uh, the science behind the disciplic succession. Not anyone and everyone can represent the disciplic succession. Not anyone and everyone can be exposed to the Vedic knowledge. There are requirements. And Prabhupada is making a very simple giving us a very simple example. If you want to represent uh, the field of law as a lawyer, then you have to graduate as a lawyer and represent that field. You can't just, you know, you a doctor cannot go and say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna represent the lawyer. No, it's it's a wrong field, wrong, the wrong qualification. Right? You can't just get a layman to give you a diagnose of your illness. You need to go to a graduate in the field of medicine. Similarly, you can't just give Tom Dicker 
uh, any Tom, Dick, and Harry can come and validate Vedic knowledge. No, uh, they need to be some sort of graduation, strict graduation. So Prabhupada's making the point that one has to come in that line. One has to have that disciplic succession to have authorized knowledge. So for us, we are blessed that Prabhupada is representing that line, taking the knowledge from that line and giving it to us in a very practical way so that we can understand it and at the same time in a relevant way according to our environment. So if we had to, for example, consider the relevance, how did Prabhupada make Krishna consciousness relevant and practical for us to appreciate and accept? Well, first thing Prabhupada did was he translated it, translated all the scriptures from Sanskrit, Bengali, to English. Imagine if Prabhupada left it in Sanskrit. And then Prabhupada had to say, okay, right, everybody needs to go study Sanskrit before they can access the knowledge. That's not relevant. It takes 14 years just to learn Sanskrit. If it's me, then it may take lifetimes. So, impossible. So Prabhupada took that translated in English and then gave it to us. Now he didn't just translate and give us to English. He didn't take the verses and translate and give, it to, give, give us the English translation. He added to the translation, he added purports. So he didn't just favor us by giving us the English translation, but he even favored us more by giving a purport to those verses and translations. In English. So this is the greatest service that Srila Prabhupada has done for humanity. That now I can access the truth which was not accessible to anyone. It's like if you have to take a layman like me, I'm able to access the truth without qualification of Sanskrit, without qualification of a disciplic succession, without qualification of Brahmanical studies, without any other qualifications required, stringent requirements to understand the truth. There may be so many. We're able to just take Srila Prabhupada's books, read in English, and appreciate the truth. And not just the truth, but the highest truth. Spotless, untainted, giving you uh, not just the truth, but compares, comparing the truth to uh, what we currently have. Giving us again and again, you know, motivations, different ways, different angles of perceiving, different aspects of the truth, uh, different dimensions. So many things Prabhupada is giving us Practically everything we need in his purpose. So no doubt Prabhupada has done the greatest service for souls that get access to this amazing wisdom. The Vedic wisdom guides us to understand our relationship with the Supreme Lord, Shri Krishna, and to act accordingly in order to achieve the desired result of returning home back to Godhead. That's basically what Prabhupada has done for us. Prabhupada has given us the Vedic wisdom, which does what? It gives us the understanding of our relationship with who? The Supreme Lord. Well, who is the Supreme Lord? Shri Krishna. See, this is the uniqueness of Srila Prabhupada's contribution. He, if you look at every other scripture, right? they'll talk about, yes, understand our relationship with the Supreme Lord. Full stop. Who is that Supreme Lord? If it's about establishing a relationship, then a relationship means understanding the name, the pastimes, 
the qualities of that person you want to develop a relationship with. So Prabhupada is giving us that. Who is the Supreme Lord? Shri Krishna. Now you know who he is. You know his name. And once you know and understand that that's what you need to do, that is understanding. That is theoretical. That is using one's intelligence and appreciating our purpose. Next step is to practice. So one is Sambandha Gyan, our understanding our relationship. Doesn't end there. That's great. That's good. That's If one knows that, that's ex an exalted position. But don't stop there. Next step is to act. Abhideya. To act according to that, those instructions. To act as a servant of Krishna. Great, now I'm acting as a servant of Krishna. Don't stop there. It's not the end. This journey starts with understanding. The journey continues with application. And the journey needs to end with a destination of perfection returning back home. When you end at the desired result of returning back home, back to Godhead, which is Prayojan, now you will continue to act, but eternally in perfection in the relationship. <clears throat> but materialistic men do not understand this. They want to make a plan to become happy in a place where there is no happiness. Now we need to read this again and again and again and again until we get it. So I'm going to read this again. They want to make a plan to become happy in a place where there is no happiness. That means that no matter what plans people make in this world, they will never, ever be happy. No matter how scholarly, no matter how advanced, no matter how futuristic, no matter where and how far they evolve, to whatever extent, to whatever degree, from the lowest planet to a highest planet, from north to south, doesn't matter what situation, no one will be happy. Why? Because Prabhupada is making it very clear. There is no happiness in this world. Now Prabhupada is making the statement, understanding our true reality, understand the true reality of the spiritual world and the true reality of the material world. And Prabhupada now goes and extends this further. That one statement should have been good enough. That yes, I should not make any plans in this place to become happy. Why? Because there is no happiness in this place. It's like, it's like digging in a place where there's no gold. Trying to find gold. Your effort is going to be in vain. So now Prabhupada, he doesn't just stay this, make the statement. He now you know, goes and extends the statement so that we get it. If we have not got it already, well, he's going to now try to extend this further and make it make, make it sure, make sure that we understand why Prabhupada is making this point. Why does scripture make this point? For false happiness, they try to reach other planets, either by Vedic rituals or spacecraft. But they should know for certain that any amount of materialistic adjustment for becoming happy in a place which is meant for distress, cannot benefit the misguided man because after all, the whole universe with all its paraphernalia will come to an end after a certain period. You eternal, therefore, you need eternal happiness. If you're in the material world, which is temporary, 
then the pleasure that is related to the material world is temporary. That means that's not the real happiness for you. So that's the first point. Then Prabhupada says, then all plans of materialistic happiness will automatically come to an end. The intelligent person therefore makes a plan to return home back to Godhead. Such intelligent person surpasses all the pangs of material existence like birth, death, old age, and disease. So if you really want to be happy, then you need to become free from birth, death, disease, and old age. And the only way you can do that is returning back to Godhead, back to the spiritual world. If you return back to the spiritual world, you automatically will be happy. In this material world, we can insulate ourselves by creating what we call a Vaikuntha bubble by association with devotees, by satsang, by Krishna consciousness. I can create a, a spiritual environment that allows me to bathe in that environment and to also experience the nature of that environment which gives me relief from the material distresses that are there while living in this incompatible environment so that I can use my time to perfect my journey back home. He is actually happy because he has no anxieties of material existence. But as a compassionate sympathizer, he feels unhappiness for the suffering materialistic men. And he occasionally comes before the materialistic men to teach them the necessity of going back to Godhead. All the bona fide acharyas preach this truth of returning home back to Godhead and warn men not to make a false plan for happiness in a place where there is no, where there is only a myth. So those who are in Brahma Loka, uh, they do not have any, as the verse described, uh, no old age, no disease, um, no anxiety. That doesn't mean that that's the perfect place to be situated. Why? Uh, because that is still temporary. And because that is still temporary, therefore, we do not aspire to return uh, back to Brahmaloka, even the highest uh, planet. We actually want to return back to Goloka Vrindavan, our real home. So Prabhupada is encouraging us, firstly, to understand the reality of this material world. This material world is not a place to be happy. It's not designed that way and it'll never be. No matter how futuristic, how, for, how much foresight, how much technological advancement scientists make with DNA, with energy, with manipula manipulating these things, immaterial. Krishna has designed it for a specific purpose. The purpose is to get us to leave this environment, to return back to his shelter. There may be highs and lows in terms of happiness and distress, but you can never get an environment that's free from anxiety. It does not exist in this material world. Only when one goes to the spiritual world, which is called Vaikuntha, which is free from anxiety, that's where there is no anxiety. Of the material world, there is anxiety there, but that anxiety is in service to Krishna. How can I serve Krishna? How can I please Krishna? But there is no material anxiety. 
28. Tato visesham pratipadya nirbayas tenat mana tenat manampo nalamurti art varam jotir mayo vayum upetakale vyavat manakam brida atmalingam. After reaching Satyaloka, the devotee in the devotee is specifically able to be incorporated fearlessly by the subtle body in an identity similar to that of the gross body. And one after another, he gradually attains stages of existence from earthly to watery to fiery, glowery, glowing, glowing and airy, and airy until he reaches the ethereal stage. Anyone who can reach Brahma Loka or Satya Loka by dint of spiritual perfection and practice is qualified to attain three different types of perfection. One who has attained a specific planet by dint of pious activity attains, the, attains places in terms of his comparative pious activities. One who has attained the place by dint of Virat or Hiran, Hiranyagarbha worship is liberated along with the liberation of Brahma. But one who attains the place by dint of devotional service is specifically mentioned here in relation to how he can penetrate into the different coverings of the universe and thus ultimately disclose his spiritual identity in the absolute atmosphere of supreme existence. So different persons can achieve Brahmaloka according to different means. And according to your different means, you will get a different result. It's interesting how people say all paths lead to the same goal. Like all rivers lead to the ocean. Which in essence is not really true because some rivers dry. Some rivers you know, get distracted and stay into a, a lake, get caught in a lake. But Prabhupada is giving another example here to also disprove that point that all roads lead to the same destination. Here the destination is Brahmaloka. So different souls using different paths, three are described. They all reach Brahmaloka. But depending on how they reach Brahmaloka, what path they use, they will get a respective destination. It doesn't mean that everybody is reached to Brahmaloka, therefore everybody is going to go home. Back to God, no. If uh, your path was through pious activity, then you're going to get a pious destination. If it was through uh, meditating on the Virat Rupa, uh, then there's liberation according with Lord Brahma. And if it's through devotional service, then you will penetrate the coverings of the universe that we talked about the seven different coverings and return back to the spiritual world. So different processes that allow you to reach the same destination of Brahma Loka gives you a different destination because of the processes. So the highest process and the highest destination is devotional service. According to Srila Jiva Goswami, all the universes are clustered together up and down. And each and every one of them is separately, is separately sevenfold covering. And each and every one of them is a separately sevenfold covering. Watery portion is beyond the sevenfold covering. And each covering is ten times more extensive than the previous covering. The personality of Godhead who creates all such universes by his breathing, pre breathing period, lies above the cluster of universes. The water of the causal ocean is differently situated within the covering water of the universe. The water that serves as covering for the universe is material, whereas the water of the causal ocean is spiritual. As such, the watery covering mentioned herein is considered to be the false egoistic covering of the living entities. 
and the gradual process of liberation from the material coverings, one after another, as mentioned here in, is, grad is the gradual process of being liberated from false egoistic conception of the material gross body, and then being absorbed in the identification of the subtle body till the attainment of pure spiritual body in absolute realm of the kingdom of God. So the Supreme Lord is uh, lying on the Karana Ocean, causal ocean. That Karana Ocean is spiritual. The covering uh, that is there in the material world, like we have our ocean uh, in this earth planet, we have the ocean of water. So that water is material. The covering of the earth layer, that's material. The causal ocean is also water, but it's of a different substance. And that substance is spiritual. And that is uh, the ocean that Karana Daksai Vishnu uh, lies on. Shilasida Swami confirms that a part of the material nature after being initiated by the Lord is known as the Mahatattva. So the Mahatattva is the raw ingredients. When creation hasn't even started, all the raw ingredients is the Mahatattva. Or right? Pradhan, you could even say the Pradhan is the raw ingredients and it gets activated uh, by Mahavishnu. A fraction, fractional portion of the Mahatattva is called the false ego. A portion of the ego is the vibration of sound. And a portion of sound is atmospheric air. A portion of the airy atmosphere is turned into form. It's turned into forms. And for the forms constitute the power of electricity or heat. Heat produces smell of the aroma of the earth. And the gross earth is produced by such aroma. And all these combined together constitute the cosmic phenomenon. The extent of the cosmic phenomenon is calculated to be diametrically both ways, four billion miles. Then the covering of the universe begins. The first stratum of the covering is calculated to extend 40 billion miles. And the subsequent covering of the universe are respectively fire, effulgence, air, ether, one after another, each extends 10 times further than the previous. So uh, there is, just in, first, in terms of creation, so here Prabhupada's briefly, uh, this will be extended further in the, tent, in the third canto as well. Uh, briefly, Prabhupada is describing the creation. The Mahatattva, which is the raw ingredients, once that's activated and uh, excited by Mahavishnu, creation starts. And creation starts very systematically. It unfolds very systematically from one subtle element to the next element that is more gross in nature. And all as, the, all, as all the elements are unfolded, unpacked, Together with the elements are also the sensory objects to perceive those elements. So, for example, uh, when they smell uh, or when they, yeah, when they scent fragrance, aroma, then there's also the power to smell that is created. So this process of creation uh, is compared to, I don't know if you know, uh, I think they call them Chinese dolls. Uh, you have a Chinese doll and then you You un 
you know, take the next Chinese dog and within that is another Chinese dog. So in this way, uh, you Russian dog. All right, thank you. <laughs> Russian doll. okay. So not Chinese doll, Russian doll. So uh, you get Russian doll like that. Uh, similarly, uh, the creation is also like that from the one element, within that one element, further elements come. Within those elements, further elements. And this, it unfolds. Right? So, uh, from matatva, false ego. False ego, uh, there is vibration of sound. Because sound is there, air is produced. Then from air, form is produced. Atmosphere, uh, form. Then fire, heat. Then earth, smell. Uh, then grosser elements in terms of what we see. Using those elements, we then obviously see all the variegatedness that exists. So if you had to look at earth, water, fire, air, ether, and then uh, the more subtle elements up to false ego. This is how creation is produced. And as creation is unfolding, all by the power of sound, which also emanates from Krishna's flute, which Lord Brahma hears, then the Vedas are produced. And from the Vedic sounds, all the different creation emanates. In the Vedic system, creation can, creation uh, happens through sound. We're going to, we'll hear this in the second canto as well. Or actually third canto, when Brahma creates. So Brahma will just either think of a word or think of something or say a word and creation manifests. So Prabhupada uh, in another purport makes the point that just as sound creates creation, from sound all creation emanates, manifests. Similarly from sound you can reverse the process of creation and liberate yourself. Sound creates everything, and therefore, in every aspect, there is sound. You find there is sound in earth, there's sound in water, there's sound in fire, there's sound in air. There's sound in every element that exists. Why? Because sound is the first aspect that is manifested, and sound is vibration. So, therefore, you'll find in the modern circles they talk about everything is energy. Every talk, everything is vibration. Right? In the beginning was word. Everything is vibration. So this vibration, where did this first vibration come from? Came from Krishna's vibrating the flute, sound. So in this way, uh, all sound is manifested. The Vedic sound is manifested. Creation is there. Then in the second aspect is in terms of this creation is manifested. Right? And the size of this specific universe, our Brahma has four heads. And because our Brahma has four heads, therefore our size of the universe is four billion miles in diameter. There are other universes uh, that, are, that have Brahmas of 10 heads, therefore 10 billion miles. Other universes that have Brahmas of Brahma with 100 heads, 100 billion miles. Our universe is the smallest. Therefore our Brahma has four heads, the smallest Brahma in creation. There are Brahmas that, Brahmas that have billions of heads. Can you imagine the size of that universe? Now, probably just using our, uh, our size, you know, our universal size, 4 billion miles. So that's the universe. Now, the first layer, which covers, there's seven layers that cover the universe. The first layer that covers the universe, that first layer is 10 times the size of the universe. So the universe is 4 billion miles, therefore 10 times that uh, is 40 billion miles. So the first covering is 40 billion miles in diameter. The next one is 400 billion miles. Then 4 trillion miles. Like that, each, each layer, uh, 7 layers. So you can imagine the size to penetrate. That's why Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Mayam etam tarantite. You cannot overcome, you cannot cross this ocean of material. You cannot break through this prison house. 
the walls are way, way, way too large. Because as the soul penetrates to the wall, as I mentioned, there's obstacles there. Uh, there's other security mechanisms within these layers. Uh, you can't just gate crash. You can't escape. It's impossible to leave. Fearless devotees of the Lord penetrates each one of them and ultimately reaches the absolute atmosphere where everything is one and the same spiritual identity. Then the devotee enters one of the Vaikuntha planets where he assumes exactly the same form as the Lord and engages in loving transcendental service of the Lord. That is the highest perfection of devotional life. Beyond this, there is nothing to be desired or achieved by the perfect yogi. So if a yogi is expert, if the yogi is perfectly situated, then uh, he is able to mechanically move through these layers. He's able to move through the different planets and then he's able to move through these different layers and return back to Vaikuntha. For a devotee of the Lord who's practicing devotion service, Bhakti Yoga, uh, our process is very simple. How is our process very simple? Uh, Krishna basically just takes us by the hand and takes us back. We don't need to go through all these layers and uh, walls and mechanisms that is there. Because the yogi is using a mechanical process of escaping and elevating himself to higher places and dimensions, he has to go through these mechanical structures of uh, coverings. But for a devotee, um, all these structures just disappear. Krishna is already there in the spiritual world. You are already there. Uh, saves us all the hassle and trouble. 29. Granena gandam rasanena virasam rupam chadrishtya swashanam kochaiva strotrena chokatya nabogu natvam Prane Natchukchaku Tim Upaiti Yogi. The devotee thus surpasses the subtle objects of different senses like aroma by smell, the palate by tasting, vision by seeing forms, touch by contacting the vibration of the ear, by ethereal identification, and the sense organs by material activities. Purport. Beyond the sky, there are subtle coverings resembling the elementary coverings of the universe. The gross coverings are development of partial ingredients of subtle causes. So the yogi or devotee along with liquidation of the gross elements relinquishes the subtle causes like aroma by smell, smelling. The pure spiritual spark, the living entity, thus becomes completely cleansed of all material contamination to become illegible, for entrance into the kingdom of God. So as we mentioned in the beginning, the soul has different layers of covering. He's got a body made of earth, water, fire, air, and ether. He's got the mind, intelligence, and false ego. With these, he's got the senses that are there. And the yogi needs to be able to transcend all these different coverings so that his true spiritual nature, spiritual spark of Satchidananda Vigra manifests. For a devotee, a devotee engages in the eternal activity of devotional service, which is transcendental and non-different from the Supreme Lord. The devotee engages in hearing, chanting, glorifying the Supreme Lord, which is non-different from the Supreme Lord. And that association purifies him of all these layers. And this is how the devotee is able to see his true self. By the mercy of the holy name, by the mercy of the process, the revelation happens. The yogi, he has to mechanically deal with these different layers 
of matter as well as a subtle contamination of subtle covering. And he needs to transcend all of them. Why? Because they have nothing to do with him as a spiritual pure spark. The spiritual pure spark is only in relation to Krishna as a spiritual servant. He's got nothing to do with matter. That's why in one purport, Prabhupada says, even the distress, the suffering that the living entity feels in this material world is superfluous to me. It's like fictitious because it has nothing to do with you. It's all there due to the coverings and the layers of contamination that we have, that we experience the illusory type of happiness and distress to be part of our happiness and distress, but actually has nothing to do with you. So right, property is interchangeably using the example of the yogi as a devotee because he is, he has understood his devotional destination. It's just that his process is that of uh, the stanga yogi. Right? Or uh, using uh, the initial gradual process of meditating on the Viratru. 30. Sabhuta Shukshmenindriya, Shukshmenindriya, Sanikarsham, Manoman, Manomayam, Deva Mayam, Vikaryam, Samsadhya Gatya, Sahatena Yati, Vignana Tatvam, Guna Sani Rodham. A devotee, thus surpassing the gross and subtle forms of covering, enters the plane of egoism. And in that status, emerges the material modes of nature, ignorance and passion in this point of neutralization and thus reaches egoism in goodness. After this, all ego egoism is merged in Matatva and he comes to the point of pure self-realization. We will hear about ego as the initial subtle element triggered by the three modes to create different types of elements. So, for example, egoism in contact with the mode of goodness produces the mind. Okay, So there's different elements uh, of creation or different stages of creation that unfolds and then the whole creation manifests. Similarly, now the yogi is reversing the process, merging. So if, you have, if I go back to the Chinese doll, once all the dolls, oh, sorry, Russian doll, <laughs> once uh, all the dolls are taken out, then you'll have the last doll, which now cannot be uh, broken down into further, further doll, right? So now you take that doll, and now you put that doll back into where it came from. And in this way, you start uh, recreating the doll. So like that, uh, the yogi reverses the process. And finally, uh, the last ingredients or elements is egoism with the modes. So mode of passion, mode of ignorance, then merges with the mode of passion, then, then merges with uh, the mode of goodness, which then merges into false ego. And then finally, uh, he has now unwrapped, unwind all the elements. We can appreciate it's a very, very tedious, uh, very mechanical process, but it is there. Pure self-realization, as we have several times discussed, is the pure consciousness of admitting oneself to be the eternal servant of the Lord. We'll see how Srila Prabhupada never deviates from the actual truth of representing the truth that is aligned to devotional service. Most people will talk about pure consciousness as energy, you know, and if you're unfolding and unwinding all these things, you'll come 
to the state of understanding your pure consciousness or pure energy with the universal energy. And now you become one with all the energy energies that are there, you know, and people will give this type of understanding. But Prabhupada, you know, always brings us back to the reality. Pure consciousness means that I have understood and realized I'm an eternal servant of the Lord. That's the identity of pure consciousness. Thus, one is reinstated in his original position of transcendent loving service to the Lord, as will be clearly explained in the following verse. This stage of rendering transcendent loving service to the Lord without any hopes of emolument from the Lord or any other way can be attained when the material senses are purified and the original pure state of the senses is revived. It is suggested here in that the process of purifying the senses is by the yogic way, namely the gross senses merge into the mode of goodness and the subtle senses merge into the mode of passion. The mind belongs to the mode of goodness and therefore is called devamaya or godly. Perfect purification of the mind is made possible when one is fixed in the conviction of being the eternal servitor of the Lord. Perfect purification of the mind is made possible when one is fixed in the conviction of being the eternal servitor of the Lord. So here is a wonderful <clears throat> way we can contemplate. on how the mind can be trained and focused and purified, perfectly purified. The more one is fixed in the conviction that you are an eternal servant of the Lord. So anything that allows you to solidify that conviction more and more and more that implies your mind is becoming more and more purified. When your mind is completely purified, means you're perfectly convinced that you're a servant of Krishna. When that happens, you're perfectly liberated, perfectly free. And we'll see how Prabhupada, you know, throughout the process of Krishna consciousness, from beginning to end, somebody comes to the temple, they bow down. Already the idea, the molding is there that I'm a servant, I'm submissive to the Lord, is starting to unfold. You come down to you come in the temple, you bow down. You see the deities, you bow down. So this bowing down is a physical means of solidifying a conviction that I am a servant of Krishna. By doing that, external practice, a mechanical process, a physical process, is purifying the mind. Then there may be subtle processes. For example, a more subtle process is, for example, chanting. Krishna, Hare Krishna. Please engage me in your service. Please accept me as your servant. So that conviction is molding now more on a subtle level and purifying the mind. So like that, uh, we chant, we get purified, Cheto Dharpana Marjanam, this purification is happening. That purification basically means I'm becoming more and more convinced that I'm a servant of Krishna. The more you become convinced I'm a servant of Krishna, the more you want to serve Krishna, the more you want to dedicate your life to Krishna, the more you want to please Krishna's senses. The more you do that, the more you become free from maya. So becoming free from maya is not just some, you know, some, some sort of hallucination, you just think I'm free or no. It's a very practical process 
of becoming free in terms of our conviction as a servant. Therefore, simple attainment of goodness is not a material mode. One has to surpass this stage of material goodness and reach the point of purified goodness or Vasuda Sattva. This Vasuda Sattva, Vasudev Sattva, this Vasudev Sattva helps one to enter into the kingdom of God. This was also discussed in the first canto. We need to uh, move, raise, rise above all the three modes and finally come to pure goodness. We may also remember in this connection that the process of gradual emancipation by the devotee in the manner mentioned above, although authoritative, is not viable in the present age because, the, because people's been primarily unaware of the yoga practice. So now Prabhupada is bringing it down to earth, down to our level, down to the rel relevancy of the current times. Yes, this process was there in the previous ages. They were qualified. They knew the process and they were qualified. In Kali Yuga, people don't know this process. So that's the first disqualification. The so-called yoga practice by the professional protagonists may be philosophic, may be physiologically beneficial, but such small success cannot help one in the attainment of spiritual emancipation as mentioned above. I mentioned here. 5,000 years ago, when the social status of human society was in perfect Vedic order, the yoga process mentioned herein was a common affair for everyone because everyone, especially the Brahmanas and Kshatriyas, were trained in the transcendental art under the care of the spiritual master far away from home in the state, status of Brahmacharya. Modern man, however, is incompetent to understand it perfectly. Lord Sri Chan Mahaprabhu, therefore, made it easier for the prospective devotee of the present of the present age in the following specific manner. Okay, so this whole process of unfolding the different elements, penetrating through the different layers of material creation, uh, experiencing the different purificatory processes, uh, un reveling one's identity, uh, removing all the different layers of contamination, going from one uh, you know, material universe to a material planet to another planet, different demigods planets getting purified of different uh, desires. All this for us is not practical and not relevant. Okay, what is relevant? Lord Shri Mahabha therefore made it easy for the prospective devotee of the present age in the following specific manner. So now Prabhupada is going to go and explain the same process of liberation that we've gone through now, that the yogi goes through you know, in this material world from, practical, from a mechanical process. How is that achieved for us in Krishna consciousness? And not only in Krishna consciousness, but for for the uh, for all people of this planet. Ultimately, there is no difference in the result. First and foremost point is that one must understand the prime importance of bhakti yoga. The living being in different species of lives undergoing different terms of engagement according to the fruit of actions and reactions. But in the execution of different activities, one who secures some resources in bhakti yoga can understand the importance of service to the Lord through the causeless mercy of the Lord, as well as that of the spiritual master. So the first point is to understand the importance of bhakti yoga. You will only understand the importance of bhakti yoga if you apply some resources there. That means apply some time there. Give some time. Put some energy. Do some thinking around this. Engage in some practical devotional bhakti yoga and see. A sincere soul is helped by the Lord through meeting a bona fide spiritual master, a representative of the Lord. By the instruction of such a spiritual master, one gets the seed of bhakti yoga. Now, 
as we're going through these, uh, and probably going to give us the stages, as we go through these stages, try to apply or try to uh, superimpose yourself where you are in the stage. Where are you in terms of this process? Okay. So uh, we definitely have got the most causeless mercy of the Lord. Why? Because we've got a spiritual master like Srila Prabhupada who's coming in disciplic succession, who's given us the seed of devotion. Lord Sri Jit Mahaprabhu recommends that the devotee sow the seed of bhakti in his heart and nurture it by water, by watering of hearing and chanting the holy name, fame, etc. of the Lord. So we're chanting Hare Krishna. That's how we're watering. We're hearing Bhagavatam. That's how we're watering. Now we're glorifying the Lord. That's how we're watering. So we seem to have come through these different stages. Then a simple process of offenselessly chanting and hearing the holy name of the Lord will promote one very soon to the stage of emancipation. Now Prabhupada is saying that that where we've come to now, you're chanting the glories, you're chanting the name, but there is a quality that's required to that chanting. Just as the yogi has specific austere practices, we also have a specific austere practice in relation to chanting. The austerity of the practice in chanting the holy name is that it needs to be offenseless. You can get benefit from chanting even inattentively, but you can't get the supreme benefit of pure devotion by inattentive chanting. So therefore, Prabhupada is saying, and here he's using the adjective, simple process of offenseless chanting. Unfortunately, the environment is surcharged and creating a more complicated process, a more difficult process. There are three stages in chanting the holy name of the Lord. The first stage is the offensive chanting of the holy name. The second is the reflective stage of chanting the holy name. And the third stage is the offenseless chanting of the holy name. So we ev everyone starts with offensive chanting. Then we start to become more reflective. We start to think. We start to contemplate. We start to see that these are aspects of inattentive chanting. These are aspects of offensive chanting. I need to move away. I need to you know, be more attentive. So then slowly one is going into that clean, cleansing stage or clearing stage of chanting. And that will happen for a while. And the more and more I start chanting attentively, then I will come to the offensive stage. And when I come to the offenseless stage, uh, then I now uh, can perfect my life. In the second stage only, the stage of reflection between offensive and offenseless stage, one automatically attains the stage of emancipation. And in the offenseless stage, one actually enters into the kingdom of God. So there's offensive chanting, clearing chanting, and offenseless. When you are in the reflective or clearing stage of chanting, you are already liberated. Which means that even to go to the clearing stage or reflective stage is a very, very advanced level. Extremely advanced. Means liberation, practically. So we should not undermine the offensive the offensive stage of chanting even that stage of chanting is very 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 advanced but that is not the goal that is not the destination and in the offenseless stage one actually enters in the kingdom of god although physically he may apparently be within the material world he attains the offenseless, offenseless stage. To attain the offense, offenseless stage, one must be on guard in the following manner. So now Srila Prabhupada is going to tell us, okay, 
we know that the offenseless stage of chanting is broken because it's a process. Step one, step two, step three, step four is a process. So I need to go from offensive to reflective to clearing. From offensive to reflective clearing stage to offenseless stage. I need to go through the stages. Okay, so what do I do to protect myself to be able to go through those stages? So your Prabhupada, by his mercy, is now going to share. When we speaking of hearing and chanting, it means not only should one chant and hear the holy name of the Lord as Ram, Rama Krishna, or systematically as the 16 names, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. But one should also read and hear the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam in the association of devotees. Number one. So this is what we can do to help ourselves go from offensive to offenseless chanting. We can associate, as probably is very clearly stating, we should also read and hear the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam in association of devotees, which is what we're doing. So the activity that we are currently doing is actually helping us chant more offenselessly. This primary practice of bhakti yoga will cause the seed already sown in the heart to sprout and by a regular watering process as mentioned above, the bhakti yoga creeper will begin to grow. By systematic nurturing, the creeper will grow to an extent that it will penetrate the covering of the universe, coverings of the universe. As we have heard in the previous verses, reach the effulgent sky, the Brahma Jyoti, and go further and further, further and further, and reach the spiritual sky, where there are innumerable spiritual planets called Vaikuntha Lokas. Above all of them is Krishna Loka, or Goloka Vrindavan, where in the growing creeper enters and takes Sri repose at the lotus feet of Lord Krishna, original personality of God. So consider, compared to the yogi, the yogi is moving to different destinations. We're not moving to different destinations. We are grounded on earth. But by practicing the process of hearing and chanting, attentively in association devotees, Creeper, the, the, the bhakti creeper, the seed that is sown, is nurtured and starts to sprout and becomes a creeper. And this creeper grows and this creeper starts to penetrate the different layers of the universe through Vaikuntha into Goloka Vrindavan. When one reaches the lotus feet of Lord Krishna and Goloka Vrindavan, the watering process of hearing and reading has all as, as also chanting the holy name in pure devotional stage fructifies and the fruits grown there <clears throat> in the form of love of God are tangibly tasted by the devotee. Even though he is here in this material world. So we're not going anywhere. We're still on the earth planet and we continue chanting and hearing in a source and devotees. So that's why this process of hearing and chanting collectively in a source and devotees is very, very powerful. <clears throat> Ripened fruit, fruits of love of God are relished only by devotees constantly engaged in the watering process as described above. But the working devotee must always be mindful so that the creeper which has so grown will not be cut. So now there's a warning. Remember I mentioned the yogi, the karmi, the jnani, they all are on different paths, but every one of them have obstacles. They have byproducts that become obstacles. 
even the devotee of who's following Krishna consciousness, the path of hearing and chanting, he also has obstacles that he has to be cautious of. So here are some of the obstacles that Prabhupada is going to now highlight. So the devotee, as he's hearing and chanting and the scripture is growing, he needs to make sure, he needs to protect the scripture. That the scripper will not get cut off. So how can the scripper be cut off? Therefore, he should be mindful of the following considerations. Number one, offense at offense by one at the feet of a pure devotee may be likened to a mad elephant who devastates a very good garden if it enters. Two, one must be very careful to guard himself against such offenses at the feet of, a, of pure devotees just as one protects a creeper by all round by all round fencing it so happens that by the watering process some weeds are also grown and unless such weeds are uprooted the nurturing of the main creeper or creeper of bhakti may be hindered so that just the first uh, two are uh, in aspects of making sure that we avoid Vaishnav Aparat. We avoid offending uh, the devotees of the Lord. And we're not going to expand on this. Uh, this is obviously a whole different topic or subject, separate cause altogether. Uh, but uh, we should be careful of this mad elephant offense. It is a very grave offense, very dangerous offense, Hatimata offense. So uh, we should be mindful and careful, protect ourselves, we need to guard ourselves from this specific offense. Then uh, we also need to uh, be careful of the weeds. The hearing and chanting also waters the weeds. And uh, weeds, unwanted desires, may also appear. And we need to uproot them. So we have to be very careful of the weeds. Actually, these weeds are material enjoyment, merging of the self in the absolute without separate individuality and many other desires in the field of religion, economic development, sense enjoyment, and emancipation. Which means can be very subtle. You may have a subtle desire that can basically distract and deviate your whole devotional process. So we have to always be alert. And you know your desires. You know what's happening inside. So you need to be on guard. There are many, there may be desires that, you know, physically, externally become visible. Therefore, association is powerful because in, some, in, in that association, uh, those who are advanced can detect. Uh, but there may be desires that are very subtle in your mind that you may be exploiting and that can distract you from the past. Five, there are many other weeds like disobedience to the tenets of the revered scriptures, unnecessary engagements, killing animals, and hankering after material gain, prestige, and adoration. So there's gross anartas, subtle desires, uh, gross desires. Then there's also subtle anartas, subtle desires. So I was mentioned some of these subtle obstacles. You're not you're disobedient to scriptures, unnecessary engagement, killing animals, hankering after material gain, prestige, adoration. Six, if sufficient care is not taken, then the watering process may only help to breed the weeds, stunting the healthy growth of the main creeper and resulting in no fructification of the ultimate requirement, love of God. So it's a very practical process. And therefore, we need to always be alert, always be on guard. Pray uh, to Srila Prabhupada, pray to the Spiritual Master, uh, pray to Krishna, pray to the Holy Name, uh, pray to the deities of the Lord, pray to the Bhagavatam, to protect us from these obstacles, to keep us, uh, 
to simply focus on the goal and focus on the process, the healthy process. We don't want to be distracted unnecessarily. We have come to this path, this glorious path, after billions and billions of lifetimes, we have been exposed to this wonderful path, to the knowledge and effort, extenuous efforts of Srila Prabhupada. We have been given the spotless process and guide, guidelines and guidance the blissful process that Sri Chit Mahaprabhu has given to us through Srila Prabhupada. Now, do not waste this valuable opportunity and get distracted or disempowered by following Srila Prabhupada's warning and guidance here. Seven, the devotee must therefore be very careful to uproot the different weeds in the very beginning. Only then will the healthy growth of the main creeper not be stunted. So yes, it's not a problem if you see a material desire manifesting in your heart. But uproot it. Don't keep, don't keep watering it. Uproot it. Contemplate the danger of that. What it's going to do to your bhakti creeper, it's going to, it's like parasitic. A weed is a parasite. It steals the nutrients of the real plant, real creeper. So uh, we want to uproot. And by so doing, eight, and by so doing, the devotee is able to relish the fruit of love of God and thus live practically with Lord Krishna even in this life and be able to see the Lord in every step. So even without going back to Godhead, you can be in Godhead while in this material body. It's called Jivan Mukta. So it's not an eternal change of position. It's a change of consciousness, internal adjustment, internal transformation. Or you could say internal revelation, internal revival. You're reviving your original nature. Robert then concludes, the highest perfection of life is to enjoy life constantly in association with the Lord. And one who can relish this does not aspire after any temporary enjoyment of the material world via other media. So this is the highest. This is the destination. This is our aspiration. This is our goal. To be constantly in association with Krishna. Whether it's in the form of the Holy Name, whether it's in the form of the Bhagavatam, whether it's in the form of the deities, whether it's in the form of Sangirtan, whether it's in the form of Prasadam, uh, whether it's in the form of association devotees. In any form, we should constantly be associating with the Supreme Lord relish that association and in this way protect ourselves from anything uh, temporary, any of the temporary enjoyments that this world has to offer, gross or subtle. 31. Tenatmanatmanam upaitya santam anandamanandamayo vashane etam gati bhagavatim gatoya only the purified soul can attain the perfection of associating with the personality of Godhead in complete bliss and satisfaction in his constitutional state. Whoever is able to re renovate such devotional perfection is never again attracted by this material world and he never returns. So let us renovate. Renovate means it's already there. You're just renovating. It. You're not building it. You're not creating it. It's already there. We're just renovating. 
we should spe- we should specifically note in this verse the description of gatim bhagavatim to become merged in the rays of the para brahman the supreme personality of godhead as desired by the brahma body impersonals is not bhagavan bhagavatim perfection the bhagavatas never accept merging in the in the impersonal rays of the lord but always aspire after personal association with the supreme lord in one of the vaikuntha planets in the spiritual sky the whole of the spiritual sky of which the total number of material sky is only an insignificant part is full of unlimited number of vaikuntha planets the destination of the devotee the bhagavata is to enter into one of the planets vaikuntha planets in which of each of the personality of godhead in each of which the personality of godhead in his unlimited personal expansions enjoys himself in association of unlimited number of your devotee associates the conditioned souls in the material world after gaining emancipation by devotional service are promoted to these planets but the number of ever liberated souls is far far greater than the number of conditioned souls in the material world and the ever liberated souls in the vaikuntha planets never care to visit this mati- miserable material world shila prabhupada shares that even when krishna told him to come to this world he said but i don't want to go there like why would i want to go there as you know miserable rubbish material world and prabhupada said no i want you to go there but i don't want to go there no but i want you to go there and write these books Prabhupada. This is the mercy of Krishna and Prabhupada to take us back home. The impersonals who aspire to merge in the impersonal Brahma Jyoti effulgence of the Supreme Lord but have no conception of loving devotional service to him in his personal form in the spiritual manifestation may be compared to certain species of fish who been born in the rivers and rivulets migrate to great ocean to the great ocean they cannot stay in the ocean indefinitely for their refuge for sorry for their urge for sense gratification brings them back to the rivers and streams to spawn similarly when the materialist become frustrated in his attempt to enjoy himself in the limited material world he may seek impersonal liberation by merging either with the causal ocean or the or with the impersonal brahma jyoti fulgence however as neither the causal ocean nor the impersonal brahma jyoti fulgence afford any superior substitute for association and engagement of the senses the impersonal will fall again into the limited material world to become entangled once more in the wheel of births and deaths drawn on by the inexos in extinguishable desire for sense engagement but any devotee who enters the kingdom of god by transcendental engagement of his senses in devotional service and associates with liberated souls and the personality of god at there will never be attracted to the limited surroundings of the material world so once we return back to krishna in his eternal service uh, then we will be protected and sheltered bhagavad gita 18:5 15 also same is confirmed as lord says the great mahatmas of the bhakti yogis attain after attaining my association never come back to this material world which is full of miseries and is non permanent the highest perfection the highest perfection of life therefore is to attain his association and nothing else so prabhu is repeating it again the highest perfection of life therefore is to attain his association and nothing else and how do we attain his association through the process of bhakti yoga different processes the bhakti yogi begin being completely engaged in lord service has no attraction for any other process of liberation like jnana or yoga a devote pure devotee is 100% devotee of the lord and nothing more we should def, we should further note in this verse the two words santam and anandam which denote that devotional service of the lord can really bestow upon the devotee two important benedictions namely peace and satisfaction the impersonalist is desirous of becoming one with the supreme or in other words he wants to become the supreme this is a myth only the mystic yogi becomes 
encumbered by various mystic powers and so have neither peace nor satisfaction. So neither the impersonalist nor the yogi can have real peace and satisfaction, but the devotee can become fully peaceful and satisfied because of his association with the complete one. Therefore, merging in the absolute or attaining the same mystic powers has no attraction for the devotee. So we want peace and satisfaction, real peace, real satisfaction. We need the association of the Supreme Lord. So because we are eternal servants of Krishna, we need to be eternally in association of Krishna. When we are placed in that position, automatically we will be peaceful, we'll be satisfied, we'll be blissful, uh, and uh, there will be no other destination that we desire. Attainment of love of God means complete freedom from all other attractions. The conditioned soul has many aspirations, such as becoming a religious man, becoming a rich man, or first-class enjoyer, becoming God himself, or becoming powerful like the mystics, or actually one, wonderfully get and acting wonderfully by getting anything or doing anything. But all these aspirations should be rejected by the prospective devotee who actually wants to revive his dormant love of God. The impure devotee aspires after all the above mentioned material things by perfection of devotion. But a pure devotee has, not, has none of the tinges of the above contamination, which are the influence of material desires, impersonal speculation and attainment of mystic powers. So do not aspire for anything else but uh, to be the servant of the servant of the servant of the Lord, to be the servant of Krishna. Why Jive Sarahu Krishna Nitya Das? Your uh, eternal nature, Swaru, is to serve Krishna. So that should be our uh, identity. That should be the only upadi, the only aspiration, the only uh, designation that we should have. Nothing else. One can, one can attain the stage of love of God by pure devotional service or by a learned labor of love for the sake of the devotee's lovable object, the personality of Godhead. One can attain the stage of love of God by pure devotional service or by a learned, learned labor of love. For the sake of the devotee's lovable object, the personality of God. And to be more clear, if one wants to attain the stage of love of God, he must give up all desires for material enjoyment. He should refrain from worshipping any of the demigods. And he should devote himself only to the worship of the supreme personality of God. He must give up the foolish idea of becoming one with the Lord and desire to have some wonderful powers just to get the ephemeral adoration of the world. A pure devotee is only favorably engaged in the service of the Lord without any hope of emol emolument. This will bring about love of God, of Godhead, or the stage of Shantam and Anandam, as stated in this verse. So very clear. To be more clear, one must one, one, if one wants to attain a stage of love of God, he must give up all desires for material enjoyment because they will only bring you suffering. Refrain from worshipping any demigods because only the Supreme Lord is worshipable. Yes, respect all demigods, but don't worship. And he should devote himself 100% to worship the Supreme Lord, Krishna. 32. It, uh, Shri Tite Nipaveda Gite Tiaya Bribish Tiaya Bi Prishte Chasat Sanate Nacha Ye Vai Pura Brahmana Hatushta Ara Dito Bhagavan Vasudeva Your Majesty, Your Majesty Maj Parikshit, know that all that I have described in reply to your proper inquiry is just according to the version of the Vedas and it is eternal truth. This was described personally by Lord Krishna unto Brahma, with whom the Lord was satisfied upon being properly worshipped. Last verse. Purport. The two different ways of reaching the spiritual sky and thereby getting emancipation from all thing, all material bondage, namely 
either the direct process of reaching the kingdom of God or gradual process through the higher planets of the universe are set forth exactly according to the Vedic version of the Vedas. The Vedic version is in, in this connection are Yada Sarve Pramucha Takama Yesya Hridish Bitta Atta Marjo Britta Bhavatyatra Brahma Sama Samashnute Priyad Aranyaka Upanishad 447 and Te Rich Ter Chir Abhisham Bhavanti Priyad Aranyaka Upanishad 6 2 15. Those who are freed from all material desires, which are which are diseases of the heart, are able to conquer death and enter the kingdom of God through the archie planets. These Vedic versions corroborate the version of the Srimad Bhagavatam and later in further con and later is further confirmed by Sukadeva Goswami, who affirms that the truth was disclosed by the Supreme Personality of God at Lord Shri Krishna, Vasudev to Brahma, the first authority of the Vedas. So there are many other Vedic statements that can validate what Shukadeva Goswami has mentioned. We know that Bhagavatam is the Amala Puran. Uh, so therefore, uh, there is no need to extensively verify or validate uh, because of the position of the Bhagavatam. But there are many verses that one can even look at from the Vedas. The disciplic succession holds that the Vedas are uttered by Lord Krishna to Brahma and by Brahma to Narada. By, and by Narada to Vyasadeva, and then by Vyasadeva to Sukadeva Goswami, and so on. So there is no difference between the versions of the authorities. The truth is eternal, and as such, there cannot be any new opinion about the truth. That is the way of knowing the knowledge contained in the Vedas. It is not a thing to be understood by one's Eurokite scholarship or by fashionable interpretation of mundane scholars. There is nothing to be added and nothing to be subtracted, because the truth is the truth. One has to accept, after all, some authority. The modern scientists are also authorities for common men, for some scientific truths. The common men follow the version of the scientists. This means that the common man follows the authority. The Vedic knowledge is also received in that way. The common man cannot argue about what is beyond the sky or beyond the universe. He must accept the version of the Vedas as they are understood by the authorized disciplic succession. In the Bhagavad Gita also, the same process of understanding Gita is stated in the fourth chapter. One does not follow the authoritative version of the Acharyas, he will vainly search after the truth mentioned in the Vedas. So if you do not accept the system, process of disciplic succession, your journey to find the truth will be in vain. You'll go from pillar to post, becoming more frustrated and eventually uh, entangled eternally in material creation. But if one is open to understanding. Uh, this is how Krishna has given the truth. Uh, then the door, doors uh, to freedom is fully open. And we are fortunate that Prabhupada uh, has taken the time uh, to shed light, to direct us, to guide us, to warn us uh, in embracing this process, uh, getting all the benefits of peace, satisfaction, prosperity, pure devotion, and perfecting uh, our life in Krishna consciousness. Vantarachimad Bhagatam ki jai, Shila Prabhupada ki jai, Nitai, Go Pramanande, Hari Hari Bo. So we've taken a little more time today due to the extensive purports that were there. But nonetheless, it is beneficial and purifying. And as Prabhupada said, this is what we need to do. We should spend as much time as possible in hearing and chanting, protecting ourselves, and in this way, uh, slowly but surely, um, by the mercy of Krishna, mercy of the process, perfect our lives. Are there any other comments or questions anyone has before we end? Please share that in the chat. or unmute if you would like to. Right. 
Shamananda Prabhu says, Hare Krishna Prabhu, thanks for the great class again. Hearing about the different cities and yogi feats really are really important to note how Srila Prabhupada is very careful to give us the genuine thing, a sp specific program of Krishna consciousness and kept us away from all these other things that can easily distract us. Yes, it's very appetizing. In fact, I also loved looking at magicians and being entertained by them, even, you know, have the desire to say, oh, nice to have that. So yes, it can be a very powerful destructive force. Thanks for explaining more about the various topics touched on, like the pole star, soul's journey upwards, chanting processes, etc. Really amazing information in Shema Bhagavatam. Found nowhere else. Yes, need to go through all this again. Uh, that's true. You will not find this knowledge in any other theology. It doesn't exist. That's the position of the Bhagavatam. And that is why the Bhagavatam is for everyone. Proper want the Bhagavatam in every house so they can. This is the spiritual excitopedia. And we are fortunate to be blessed by associating with it. And yes, we have to constantly uh, associate with because Kali Yuga memory is there. When I forget certain things. So by constant association, we try to remember as much as we can. But the most important thing is we are associating with Krishna in the form of this wonderful knowledge. Thank you. Mother Les says, Hare Krishna, thanks for the Krishna Kata. From a spiritual point of view, is it better to be in a universe of four-headed Brahma versus in a universe of hundred-headed Brahma? No. Uh, it's just the vastness of material creation and the vastness of material creation uh, for us uh, has no bearing. There may be more planets, there may be more facility, but uh, Krishna says, a Brahma Bhuvanuloka, from the highest planet down to the lowest, lowest planet in every universe, a Shashwatam, Tukale Mashashwatam, it is temporary and full of misery. So for us, whether it's four headed, you know, four billion miles, 100 billion miles, a billion billion miles, for us, that is not our destination because it is full of misery and temporary. Our destination is Goloka Vrindavan, where there is eternity, there is bliss. And there's eternal service to the Supreme Lord Krishna. And wherever Krishna sends us for that service. Yes, we're happy to go to a hundred-headed, you know, Brahma's universe uh, if they serve us there. Otherwise, no interest. If there's Bhagavatam, if there's Bhagavad Gata and service, we're happy to go. If there's Krishna consciousness and service, we're happy to go. Otherwise, not interested. So in that sense, um, from a spiritual perspective, only if they serve us opportunity. Otherwise, I'm not interested. Materially, it's no different than the four-headed universe or four billion mile universe. All right. Thank you very much for everyone's time. Uh, Mother Les says, Bhakti Kripa sounds to be, sounds to me to be like a subtle spiritual umbilical cord that connects us all to the lotus feet of the Lord. Very interesting purports. All oh, the Prabhupada. Yeah. It's an interesting analogy that is given. The seed of devotion and the creeper that connects. So that's our link uh, to Krishna. And uh, we should keep that analogy in mind so that we can keep the warnings that Prabhupada has given us that this creeper can be cut. And we do not want the creeper to be cut. We do not want it to be dried. We do not want to lose this creeper. Because you can imagine if a creeper is cut or it's dried, the seed then becomes uh, in uh, the seed will then not bear its fruits. And we do not want that. So we want to always guard against Prabhupada's one. Thank you very much. Kantrach Madhubhagatam Kija, Shila Prabhupada Kija, Nitai, Go Pramanande, Hari Hari Bo.